Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All The Things podcast, episode number five, View.js. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. But before we get into what we've been doing this week, we have a quick ask of you. This is a mild milestone episode for us, so if you could leave a review or maybe give us some feedback on the show on the platform that you're listening on, so something like CastBox or Apple Podcasts, that'd be really great because we really want to improve the show moving forward. With that aside... What have you been up to this week, Mike? Hey, hey Matt. Uh, so pretty much this week we released my um, my Vue.js getting started quickly guide. Right. So right. I've been I've been kind of like engulfed in Vue. Aside from my regular contract work that we do, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing on my spare time, just learning Vue. I got a quick guide up. Uh, it's on Medium, and it kind of helps. It kind of helps you get started real quick. And I think we'll we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. For sure, uh, for sure. Matt's actually gone through it real quick so that he has some cool insight to talk about. Uh, so I think we should just get started, right? Yeah, let's jump right to it. Uh, this mm-hmm. week, I've just more or less been really hitting the social media hard, and we've been kind of digging into our insights and that sort of thing. So yeah. that's that's basically my whole week has been graphs, so more visual than something I can discuss, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> At some it, point, maybe maybe in a future episode, right? Yeah, once we actually... Because it's, it's one of those things where you kind of need you know, a few months, I would say at this point, a few months of data, and we can kind of actually formulate an episode because right now, since we're relatively small, we don't want to be like, hey, this really works. And then it finds out it was like, no, 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 somebody just just so happened to share us. And it looked like this particular thing worked, but it didn't. So I got to kind of, we got to kind of work with the data, if you will. Yeah, get some more data points. Right. Now, so I'll just kind of go through, like always, I'll kind of go through what the episode is going to be about. So like I said, Vue.js, so we're going to be doing a bit of a comparison between uh, reactive frameworks as well as static, and we'll be focusing, of course, on Vue.js for our reactive framework. We have a few segments like we always do, so segment number one is uh, static to reactive, segment number two is CMS to reactive, segment number three is how we plan to use Vue.js, Segment number four is my experience getting started with Vue.js, with Mike's guide specifically. Uh, and then, of course, web news, which we still need an intro for. And this one is called Trendy and Loud versus Silence. So there's a little bit of ambiguity there for you. But let's let's jump right in, I think. Let's jump right into the first segment. I'm going to hand it over to Mike for this guy. All right. So uh, static to reactive. So pretty much when we first started out, I'm sure everyone knows the story now. We we did the smaller sites, smaller business sites. Uh, they were just static sites for small businesses. So nothing nothing too fancy. There was really no need for us to look into these frameworks. Um, and the frameworks I'm referring to now are going to be like React, uh, Angular, and mainly Vue.js. And I'll get into the reason why it's mainly Vue.js a little bit later in the third segment. So, but for now, just bear with me. So pretty much uh, when we were going through and creating these these sites that didn't need to be dynamically generated, that didn't need to have too much user Im- input, user, user interaction, user the user actually changing elements in the DOM, uh, we kind of just decided to do HTML, JS, uh, just straight, you know, basic languages. We learned our base, just like I've said before, I'm just going to move on from that. So uh when we got to the the need for reactive is when we started to um, get some sort of reaction from the DOM. So sorry, from from the server. So if we ever needed to parse like a response from a server and then generate content based on that server response, that's when you kind of get into you know in JS document dot create element. Uh, that's not exactly the the best way to do things because it's very convoluted. Like if you look at a document to create to a document dot create element. Uh, section in your code it's kind of it's not easy to read and it's not intuitive to write either you kind of have to create each div separately put put the element like you know change the class separately on each div it's very convoluted to write now i think that's 
it's good that we did it that way to start because we didn't know any of the reactive frameworks. We're like, oh, we would just look how to change the DOM element. And it started really simple, like, oh, we just need to add a div, right? But then it got more complicated where we need to add a div with a nested div in it, with information that's dynamically generated inside that nested div. Uh, an example of that was when we started to do list by design. Obviously, we were, we were storing and generating lists from storage, from local storage. So we had to iterate through an array. And then for each and every list item, we had to create that list item dynamically based on the information in that array. Um, so that would have lent itself really well to a reactive framework like this, where you can kind of write HTML code and then inside it put like an, a for loop inside of HTML code and make sure that that for loop goes through and iterates and iterates over how many elements you have in an array. It's very intuitive and simple to write like that. Not knowing it back at, at, at that time, um, was a negative, I guess for us because it, it, it was harder to write the code, but I think also it helped us understand again that generate that base. Like I know that these reactive frameworks use all that J JavaScript code that I know how to use, which makes me understand them all a little bit better. So I, I, I don't know if I would recommend going so far as to create an app and not and avoid these reactive frameworks initially, but maybe understand how those document dot create elements work so that you know how these frameworks are manipulating a page. So um, that that's pretty much it for why we went from static to why we're going from static to reactive. We don't have too much experience with it yet, uh, which is which has given us an interesting perspective on this episode. So we're kind of like in that transition phase. And yes, we're learning about it, but we're not like experts at it. And we're going to give that 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 insight from a kind of starting out point of view. So just keep that in mind. Know that we're not 100 percent knowledgeable in this topic and we're both at different stages as well. Matt, Matt's just learning it right now. So it, I think it'll be like for a beginner learning a reactive framework, this might be a really valuable episode because you'll see how to start. And it, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, so I'm going to pass it off to Matt. Matt's going to talk about uh, how a CMS compared to reactive might look and why you might choose one or the other. Right. Uh, one thing I actually just wanted to say before I jumped into my segment was that's a really good point you made about this is sort of why you're making the jump. I think one of the hardest things to do is figure out when you should make a jump into a new, this is almost like a new uh, category, I guess, of of making a, making a site, making a project. Because mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot of the time, there's a lot of ways to get around a problem, maybe generate things client side to an extent or use something else other than a reactive framework. So this is sort of like a really good way for people to see like, hey, you know, I, I kept having to do like what you were saying, create element. So I kind of really should jump, you know, jump ship now and like kind of get into something like Vue.js or something similar. So uh, for my segment, which is CMS to reactive, basically what we started out with was, you know, we would we would do a CMS for most sites. Like if you didn't need anything didn't need any sort of editing capability, we wouldn't do a CMS for you at all. But if you needed some, like a blog or whatever, we would use WordPress or maybe Couch CMS for small business sites or maybe Workflow, or sorry, Webflow, uh, whenever whenever you just have a blog or just a site you need to update. And that kind of works. But once the elements start becoming very varied and like kind of all over the place, you really should use a custom a uh, custom solution where you can control the flow and conditionalize the pages based on the content that that comes in comes to play. So specifically, the, exactly what reactive frameworks do. So I'll kind of I'm going to mention quote unquote the hub a couple of times here. So what I mean by the hub is we have not released HTML all the things dot com yet, but we're designing it. And on the main page, we I call the the very like the the grid that hoses all our content the hub because basically it's just a grid of all the different types of content that we create like the podcast some guides the templates the snippets that type of thing so it's like the hub of all of our stuff and then you can filter it down and that sort of thing and there'll be a medium post about that later so basically the hub as i said presented a unique issue of presented us with a unique issue of not really having a standard a standard layout and everything was still con but everything still needed to be considered a quote-unquote post so i'll, I'll kind of dive into that so one of the things that we were really kind of wanting to do was do this project in Webflow. And one of the one of the issues that we had with the Webflow, specifically with the Webflow CMS, because we wanted to go all in on Webflow, use its designer, 
use its CMS, and use their hosting as well. But one of the issues that we found was we couldn't really do quote unquote the hub because we had what's because what Webflow does to break down their CMS is what's called collections. So an example would be if you had a, just a regular blog, you would have a collection that housed all of the content that that blog had to offer. And then you could link to another collection of the categories and then and that's how you would kind of categorize it. But we have the unique issue of, well, we have a podcast, so we need an embeddable like player, which we have, but we need like a spot for that. We also do templates, which we kind of need to have almost like an app store page because we need a gallery and that and that sort of thing. So since there was like the, these dynamics, like including our blogs, including our guide, including our snippet, we have this like dynamic sort of layout that's needed. And we kind of got to the point where we were like, okay, we literally, we literally need to do this custom and do it, do it, you know, in a way that we're not limited by the, the CMS collections method. It was basically just that, like, there's nothing wrong with Webflow. I want to be clear. It wasn't Webflow's fault in any way. It was just the thing that we were trying to do just didn't fit into that sort of into the way that they kind of imagined and engineered their CMS. And what we ended up doing was I kept trying to make the design different. Like I tried to make it so it was like, oh, we'll have like some fields where we'll just ignore them sometimes. Like we'll have a field there that says embeddable player and that embeddable player field in our CMS will appear for blogs, guides, the templates, the snippets, but you'll just ignore it. And it, and it's just it's just awkward. So this is where that reactive component kind of comes kind of comes in. And again, I'm really new to this, like I literally started with Vue.js today. But basically what what I'm seeing is is that we're going to be able to have a more dynamic CMS experience and have a more dynamic way to like, you know, hit the server and say, "Hey, I give me that embedded link." Give me this, uh, give me this gallery for the templates. Uh, give me this, give me this code snippet. Give me this rich text piece. So it's, it, that's really kind of what we're going for. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more, I'd say, than a standard blog of sorts that a lot of these CMSs, like the Webflow CMS, really try to aim to be. So kind of, quote unquote, the hub really kind of messed us over in that way. But it also kind of made us make the jump where we were like, okay, we have to jump in now. We have to we have to hit the ground running because I don't want to have HTML all the things.com be limited right from the get-go. So hopefully we're gonna have or we definitely are gonna have some more webflow projects in the future. But for this one, this is where you, this is where you where we had it, unfortunately to jump ship. And that is something also also to note is that and I think we've mentioned this in prior episode is definitely, you know, experiment with the tool that you're trying to use or whether you're trying to use a tool or a service like Webflow or whatever you're trying to use. And if there's limitations and you really can't get around it, it there it may be a time there may be a time like we did where you have to select something else because you don't want to have that foundation that very first iteration be very 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 limited assuming that the project is rather important. So it's just a, a little bit, little bit of uh, Cliff's notes, if you will, at the end there. But I'm going to pass it on now for the for the third segment to Mike and uh, how we how we plan to use Vue.js moving forward. Yeah, so for sure. So that, I'll I'll add a little bit to that, Matt. So um, yeah, like the the CMS route would have made sense for us, I think, if we were just sticking with like a blog, like you said. Uh, but the fact that we we decided to do all these different things would would create different pages each and every time based on the the type of post we're making, right? Right. So like yeah, we we didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves. That was that was the end. And and another another reason to use a reactive framework or to learn a new framework in general is it's a great way to kind of improve your own talent. So we know that the, these frameworks are in demand at this point. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm pretty sure React is number one, Angular number two, Vue is number three, or there, there might be a few others as well up there um, in popularity. But we look we look at that and if the, the skills are transferable between them. And I'll, I'll talk about now why we chose Vue and what we plan to do with it. So it kind of leads into it. Um, Views. I'm not going to do a, a strict comparison between Vue, React, Angular, like a lot of people do, because I don't think that 
it's fair to compare them, especially for my from myself who hasn't used all three. I have used React a little bit, Angular I haven't touched at all, uh, but I haven't used any of them extensively, not even Vue, the one that I know the most. And the, what what I do know and what I've heard from industry professionals and people that I've talked to that have used Vue, React, Vue and React before is that React has a really good base. So what that means is instead of having to rely on different libraries that not certain not the react creators created react creators or facebook they only created react so even if you wanted to extend react past the initial functionality to like uh redux redux was created by a third party uh so they're not although it's a very good library and it is supported right now facebook isn't guaranteeing its support in the future so what I like about Vue is that all their main libraries, their state management library, Vuex, their React router, all those libraries are actually maintained by the people that own React. I, I think it's Evan Yu. I could be could be wrong by that. He's a he was a previous Google engineer and he created this uh, after working on Angular for a bit. So the I really like that about Vue. The other thing is how to get started, like. Getting started with React took me a little while. The guides that I looked at are vastly different. So one guy's like, do this, 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 and then you'll get you'll get started. Like, uh, how do you create create React app. Then I look at Vue, and it's like very consistent across the guides. So you do this. You use the Vue CLI, which is actually a great tool. Uh, you can check out my quick start guide. Uh, I put a lot of my quick, concise, like cliff notes in there on how to get started. I think you can get started and up and running and start developing in React in uh, Vue in maybe five minutes. Link in uh, the show notes. There's a little link, note there. Yeah, exactly. Link in the show notes, and potentially we'll be doing a video as well on how to get started real quick. So stay tuned for that. Um, I really like the fact that you can get started real quick, and that's that's kind of what drove the initial start of my content for it as well. Uh, so the, but then also it's just really well documented. The, the document, the documentation for Vue is in my opinion, from the comparison, uh, is very like very well maintained. So those are my quite kind of like quick comparisons, but again, I'm not a professional in either of these things. I think there are many other people that have done these comparisons before and they, they have way more credibility than me. So I'm not going to compare them any further. We're just going to go with Vue and just pretend when I say reactive framework, we're, we're referring to Vue right now. So moving forward, uh, what we're going to be doing with React initially is uh, since I've made that guide, I'm going to make more guides. So the next guide is going to in incorporate a project that I've been working on that I've talked about on here called Hexdash. So it's a hexagonal uh, hexagonal a dashboard for developers. So, and I, what I want to do with it is I want to teach people how to make Vue components. And each one of these hexagon will rep, hexagons will represent a component that will do something different. And then that can be styled and, and uh, changed based on its properties and its attributes, and then can be laid out in like a main in like an app dot view file where you can kind of put however layout you want. So there'll be a, there'll probably be a link in the show notes as well to my hex dash uh, the initial post about it that we have on medium. So you guys could take a look at a little preview of what, what, what's to come. And I'll be posting a, um, a GitHub repo where people can contribute their own hexagons and we can start talking about and developing relationships, try, trying to get these hexagons in places, uh, get, get different function hexagons. So like right now I have a notes hexagon where you can enter some notes in there. I have a hexagon that uh, shows the time and date. I have a hexagon that just, you can pass in any text to and it'll display it in the center. Um, and then I have some other, some, some styling hexagons where you can just kind of put them as fillers. You, you can also change the size of the hexagon, small, medium, or large based on a property. And I'll be, and I'll be going through in a guide on how to kind of create these hexagons, how to manipulate them. And I'm hoping that that will infer some, some knowledge onto yourself to then do your own projects as well as maybe help, help out and contribute to this project as well. So, that's that's one thing we're going to be doing with Vue. The next thing is uh, it's a really cool way to just kind of internalize our library for usability. So, for instance, uh, Vue Vue components are very powerful in the fact that they're they're self-contained. So um, there's going to be a st a style for CSS, a script for JS, and a uh, a template for HTML all in one file. 
So you can kind of you can you can see how that how that could be cool because you're as you're writing the HTML, you can immediately write the CSS in that in that one file, and it's only going to be for one component. Uh, that component can be a, as small as a button. It can be a container. It can be just a nav bar. So a nav bar is a good example because you can create kind of one nav bar, make some properties in it, ha have it mobile mobile ready, and you can just pass in some information like what pages you want to link to and the titles of those pages, and it can create a dynamic nav bar for you. So you can we're gonna we can store that in a library for later use. So I can create one nav bar, use it on many projects later. Same with a button. Bam, create one one button, use that on for many projects later. So we're gonna be using Vue.js to expand our uh, reusability. So instead of having to import you know a separate CSS file, a separate uh, JS file, and a separate uh, HTML file, or in having to copy paste it into our projects, we're gonna have one file that we can just import, which is a really cool function of 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 a reactive framework like this component based especially. Um, so an, another thing that we're going to be doing, like like Matt mentioned, is we're going to use Vue.js to build HTML all the things. So the the site is going to be a hub of all of our content. So it's a I think it's a really good example of when to use one of these frameworks. And we're going to have a Node.js backend, which will just serve up JSON based on the route that we get that we give it and based on the information that it gets. And the JSON will then be used to determine the front end. So how how we will, based on the response that we get from the server, we're going to be making those components. Those, um, what did what did you call it, Matt? Again, the the which uh, sorry, which which uh, which piece? Call it, the hub, right? The hub. Oh, the hub, right, right. Yeah, sorry, so I thought you were asking eat, a Vue.js question, so I was no, immediately no, 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 no. confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Just the design question. So yeah, the hub. So when, when we create that hub, each one of those uh, posts, like it's going to be a blog guide podcast, will be a component in that response from the node server. That And then based on if it's a blog guide podcast or a snippet, it will generate a piece like a, a square pretty much with the right type at the top that's the right title and the date. So it, it's going to be very, it's very intuitive to use this kind of system uh, when we're talking about a hub integration. So then the other important part of it is that each one of those pieces of content will have its own page behind it and that page will then conditionally show where you can find that content whether it be on medium github uh it'll embed some it'll embed some snippets based on if there is snippets detected so there's again you're passing in conditional properties the page will be generated based on those condition conditions so is it a podcast post then show the podcast player and link the podcast it, it's all very is all very intuitive, and I think um, when we were going to do it the Webflow route, the CMS route, we would have had to kind of manipulate ourselves to fit in there. And now we can kind of go as we can make we can do the vision that we wanted, and I think that that was the correct decision in the end. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to what we're planning to do with uh, Vue, Matt, but I'm going to pass it off to you. And this is a good this is a good segue because. Today, actually, right before filming this, uh, recording this podcast, we sat down with Matt and we kind of went through Vue together. Right. And I made sure that Matt understood what what was going on because I want him to kind of take over the front end development. I'll do the back end and I'll generate some content that, on, as well on that. So stay tuned for some Node content potentially. Um. So and I think Matt picked it up really fast. So we we really spent how long was it, Matt? Honestly, I think I like. I mean, I use your guide. And we were chatting for a bit. I think it was like in total probably two hours, and we were honestly like chatting while the, while doing nothing towards yeah. it. So like less than less than you know not very long at all, considering we were talking about design decisions and everything else. In in just getting at view actually set up, like ten minutes, five minutes, something like that. Yeah. And really nothing, really nothing like that long. So if you know if you know your 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 stuff like HTML, CSS, JS, and you know how to make websites honestly like it's like we were like i said we were just chatting like we were casually doing it it wasn't like i was sitting there using all my brain power so that's really key and then like like we've already said before your startup guide will get you up and running really quick like i just use that and then you you and i were more or less just chatting it up so definitely definitely something something or a a good um a good like tool to use like view.js is definitely a good tool to use if you're looking to use one of these reactive things um, so I guess I guess I'll just jump right in with my actual experience of it uh, on there. So 
my basic toolbox of stuff was, you know, HTML, CSS, JS, as I mentioned. And then I would use other things like SAS or Bootstrap. And then, you know, maybe some Couch CMS here and there and Webflow, of course. So that was kind of like my, if someone approaches me with a problem, that's sort of the, the way I attack it. I'll be like, oh, do I make it myself? Do I go to Webflow? Do I go to, do I need Couch? Like, do I need, you know, Bootstrap? What do I need? So that was basically my thing. So this is going to kind of expand uh, expand my knowledge. Um, one thing to note is I already did have experience with NPM. I also do know the CLI through I- IT experience for the most part. But today was also my first day. So this was a part of the chat and a part of the reason why it took a little bit longer um, was the fact that today was my first day also using VS Code or Visual Studio Code. So yeah. Yeah, so Mike Mike basically said it, and I was just like, okay, fine, like, because I opened up a Vue.js file in Notepad++, which is my first, or which is my go-to, uh, if you can call it an IDE. Would that be considered an IDE? It's an IDE, and because, like, it's it's really extensible, I don't want to know, I don't want to knock people that use Notepad++, because you can technically do everything um technically we could have just downloaded an extension so that you could see the colorful files and you can get the syntax correction and stuff like that but i don't know i wanted him i wanted matt to try vs code because i don't i've been using it a bunch of my a bunch of the other people that code around me use it and i think it'll make it faster for him in, in the future especially with uh, a view file Well, that was the thing, too, is, like, immediately, like, I use vanilla Notepad++, to be clear. (laughs) And, like, I I mean, I I literally use it for the line numbers and the the colors, more or less. Like, I mean, like I said before, I use Vi on Linux, not Vim, so. But but I found found VS Code to be extremely fast for file browsing. Like, you have, like, your folder view. Like, I just opened up the folder. So that's super, that's super helpful, opening up the directory and seeing everything right there where I can jump between my components. And then obviously automatic it when I uh, load it up, uh, I think it's app app dot view. Is that the correct file, Mike? Yeah, that's the main like I would I call it the index file because so people understand the index.html file, but it's obviously not that. But it's the the file where your program enters. Right. So uh, basically like I open that up and it immediately suggested like, hey, you should really, you know, use this plugin called uh Vetter. I'm just gonna spell it V E T U R. Because mm-hmm. it'll, you know, colorize the text and do whatever else it does because you're using Vue. So it automatically detected a plugin that I should use. And I did end up, you know, downloading and installing that. So, you know, that's that's really good for, for like, a, a program that I use normally. Norm, like, normally uh, stuff like that will either break or just doesn't work at all uh, just from my experience. Which is why I'm, like, a really, like, low-key person. I just use the oldest stuff. <laughs> So I just I don't have much faith in in things we in hey, things I, I use. You I mean you were using Notepad plus plus not Notepad or or you could you could have used WordPad. It could have been worse. Everything it could have it could have it could have been real bad. Yeah, it could have been yeah. real bad. Or just just straight. I mean I guess Vi is kind of like just straight up Notepad. But um, yeah. moving on from that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So basically, um. We what we went through was we did the installation through your guide and then we decided okay let's get a little bit of you know let's chat it up and then let's figure out like exactly what a couple of things we should try out. So I made a simple button appear via a new component. So I made a new component, made a, made the button appear. And I was basically learning to structure things to interface with view.js. So that was one of the things I was saying where I really, I mean, I haven't really used any other reactive uh, frameworks like this, but I really am impressed with view.js because I was able to pick up the hard part of it, which is learning the code. So and understanding the CSS, understanding the the DOM, understanding, you know, basically like how to install it and all that, what is kind of quote unquote the hard part. The only th- part that I, at least at my very beginner level, the only part that I'm learning right now is basically how to interface with it. So like having that style sheet within the, within the same file as like essentially the DOM and that, and that sort of thing. Um, so this was my first project right after the hello world at intro application. So just like full disclaimer there, but basically, basically I, I'm already starting to visualize some of the ways that I can structure sites I've done in the past if I had done them in view. And one thing that Mike had mentioned, I was going to mention at the end of his segment, but I figured it kind of makes more sense here was he was mentioning that like a lot of our content, as we know, a lot of our content lives on various platforms, whether it be medium or a podcast app or whatever. And one of the one of the components, literally one of the components that I'm more than likely going to make when I make the front end for these posts 
is I'm going to make what's what we've already called internally is the availability bar. So basically, the availability bar allows you to, you know, you'll let's let's just let's just give you a, just a straight up example. So let's say you see episode five on HTML all the things dot com. You see episode five, you click on it. It'll bring you to the you know the full page thing, the full the full page for it. But then you'll have, you know, your title and all that. And right below your heading, you'll have what we call the availability bar. And it, it'll have buttons to where it's available. So like CastBox, Google Podcasts, you know, Apple Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the same with things like the blog post where it'll say, hey, it's also available on Medium. So one of the components that I'm probably going to make is I'm going to make an av- the availability bar as one of the components. And then furthermore, I may make a component for the button which I will embed in the component, which is the availability bar, which will then go into the app dot view. So like, I'm already starting to get it. Like, it's not like I'm totally clueless and I'm like, how do I make buttons in this crazy thing? Like, it's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's, it's almost, it's, and I know this is, I know it's totally different than it, but it's almost like bootstrap in that I was able to plug and play at least. Yeah. And like, you know, you know, like bootstrap, bootstrap, of course, like has a lot of, easy things to pick up like if you want to display flex i think it's just d dash flex but so like there's a lot of like those easy things and this is like no exception it's like you know it it is different but i'm able to go through and fill in css the way i want and that sort of thing and then i'm already starting to look at more advanced stuff like i want to use sas for example so because i want to use sas i have to figure out how to put that in there and then you and i had actually mike installed a node what do we install? I think we installed a filter mechanic called Isotope. I want yeah, to say. Isotope, yeah, Isotope. Yeah, Isotope. Yeah, Isotope. I always forget the name of it. Mm-hmm. Isotope. So we like install. We installed that into the project because I had never done. I've never done like a proper Node project. I've used the SAS. Yeah, like you've, you've never done an import. You never. You've never done an import. Exactly. Yeah. So we mm-hmm. were. We were. Me- we've been messing around with imports and that sort of thing, and doing like a proper node node project whereas before i've just used npm to like get tools such as sas and that and then that sort of thing Mm -hmm. so it's all coming together and i definitely say the code which i've already learned is is the hard part at least like so at least thus far yeah the initial hard part obviously there's going to be some more challenges like to come oh i kind of wanted i kind of threw i threw a a manageable amount at you i think and i wanted that's what i want to do with my uh like with my tutorials and guides as well, is I want to always throw a manageable amount at someone so they can come out and be like, oh yeah, that, you know what? I understand that and I can, and like, like I really like how you said I can really visualize how I can do my older projects in here because that's what that's what got me with Vue is like, as soon as I understood it, I'm like, holy beep, like I can go and do this. Like I can actually take in a, com- I can make this a component. Why was I creating this a million times before? Like I can just literally create one component copy paste it a million like as much as i want it just i don't know it, it clicked right like is that kind of the experience you had that that kind of click yeah it's sort of like it's sort of like so i'll just give like an actual example of the first thing that came to mind when you when you were saying that so if you if you think of a, a tech blog and you go right to their home page and it'll have all the all the different blog posts let's say listed um vertically like in a big column so you like scroll mm-hmm. down and hit them each one of those squares if you're not using something like this and not using something like Vue.js to be clear, you're going to be literally creating element every single time. You're going to like hit the the server or wherever you're getting your information for what articles are out. And you're going to like hit the server and then create an element, which is like that box that says like, oh, here's the article name and all this. Mm-hmm. In Vue, I can imagine myself just doing that with one component or maybe a couple of components nested depending on how complex it is. But the fact that I can already envision it and envision a couple of ways to do it is is pretty impressive, I think. And mm-hmm. I think it's, I don't know how other reactive frameworks uh, work. So like, like, I mean, maybe those ones are going to be easier, easy enough for me now. Cause I think I, like, like what I kind of am getting at is that I believe you and I have done our hard time in the, the pure JS, you know, pure CSS and just HTML, you know, kind of game. Whereas we're still fans of that for stuff that's easy, mm-hmm. but we're not going to shy away from if we need something advanced i'm going to use an advanced tool i'm not going to go and try to use like a like a like a caveman's club to try to, to, try to yeah. do this realistically you know what yeah. i mean like if i'm not going to reinvent the wheel every time i am going to try to you know reach out and it will expand my skills and 
probably change the way I look at some coding and that type of thing. Like you're still more back end and I'm still more front end because like hell I'm using hell I'm doing the front end mm-hmm. of this site. Yeah. But it'll still probably you know allow me to work with more allow me to work with more projects if that makes sense. Like proper node laid out projects with uh like you were showing me how to like compile it live and that type of thing. And I've used like I've used Gatsby once for another project very, mm-hmm. very briefly. So, you know, it's, and I was really lost then. So, like, I think, like, this is really going to help help expand our way of doing things. And it, it's sure. just another toolbox when somebody – or something – another tool in the toolbox where when somebody comes to me with a problem, instead of me going to my old tools, like I said in the beginning of the segment, uh, I, this is a new one now. And it's, it seems like a pretty advanced one. So, I could – you know, kind of envision another way to do it if I if I don't want to do it in Webflow or Couch or do it myself kind of thing. So, but Absolutely. yeah, for sure. Did you have anything else to add uh, add to that? I think we can move on to the to the favorite segment of the show, web news, if you want. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's get the rant going. Let's right. do it. So, web news this week. So this is uh, this. I believe this is my web news. We had we had, we had a lengthy discussion um, like before the podcast. So I believe this one this was my web news this week. Yep. And Basically, what it is is it's kind of abstract, but it's 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 sort of the the hit on how do I really explain this? I'm trying to like engulf it. So it's what I have literally written down here is trendy and loud versus silence. So what I mean by that is a lot of the time you'll have you know let's say you hit up the you hit up a subreddit with a bunch of like designers like web designers on there. And they're constantly changing frameworks and, you know, they're changing stuff and they have crazy workflows and, oh, uh, yesterday I used to build and tomorrow, what are you doing? You shouldn't be building, you should be compiling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I have written down here for an example is Node.js versus PHP and big frameworks versus old ones. So for example, right from WordPress.com, we checked today, it said WordPress powers 31% of the internet. And... Then that's you big, have a, that's huge. That's a really, really yeah, that's big a, that's piece a of the big, web. Big chunk, but like for if, one framework, like a like one framework. <laughs> okay. That's like, not that's not like a technology. That's that's just a framework on top of a technology. So, could you imagine too if we were powering one percent of the web? Like like we'd be running around like freaking crazy here. So thirty one percent millions is, of sites. It'd be. It, It'd be crazy, like just absolute chaos. Yeah. Like in terms of office infrastructure, it'd just be yeah. absolute chaos. So another thing I have to compare that to is, okay, something newer comes along, such as uh, Webflow. So, you know, WordPress versus Webflow. But then, you know, we ha- then there's like a workflow conflict and this type of thing. So I'm going to try to give some specific examples. So WordPress, com- WordPress came out a while ago, took the blogging world by storm, if you will, and sort of became a standard. But when we came onto the scene, a lot of people wanted WordPress and a lot of people clear- clearly still want WordPress. But we weren't really impressed with how heavy it felt and we didn't really want to learn specifically how to do the templates for it and that type of thing so we kind of went you know more more like the pure learning road as we've said before and then we started using other tools like couch cms or we started using things like like webflow and that and that sort of thing and webflow is that new kit on the block it has a visual coder it has a different type of cms if you if you want you can you know export your your webflow code and just completely skip the CMS and install your own CMS and WordPress is very much like, you know, you have your WordPress, you mm-hmm. more or less, you, you download or you make a template, you use a variety of plugins that, you know, need to generally be compatible with your theme. So it's like a theme workshop or it's like a theme marketplace. And then there's like a pot, there's essentially a plugin marketplace. You mush those together, right. To get all the functionality you need. And then there's your site. And that's what mm-hmm. WordPress kind of is. But what's weird hope, is what's hope for the best basic. Well, like, I mean, there's a lot of like, conflicts and that type of thing, but yeah. going beyond the, the, the technical, the technical issues of plugins and that sort of thing. It's super interesting that we, when we hit the scene, like I said, WordPress was sort of, you know, we weren't really massive fans of it. Not that there's anything wrong with it to be clear, but just, we weren't massive fans of it. And then kind of the industry kind of seemed to do do the same thing where people are starting to use different CMSs, uh, Statamic, um, if I, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. There, you know, there's Couch CMS for like, you know, smaller sites and that and that sort of thing. But look at the silence. There's like this, there's like the silent elephant in the room. And this is what we're talking about. WordPress powers 31% of the internet. 
And what we think, and what one of our theories is, and we'll probably dive, and we're going to dive into this in conversation wise is, and this is a question, so I'm not telling, I'm asking kind of thing, is are freelancers pushing the industry fringe tech? Are freelancers the driving force essentially in using this new framework, this new workflow, this new, this new, this new, whatever? Whilst the larger enterprises are sticking with the older stuff and adopting slower. And we can see that having been in IT, both you and I, Mm -hmm. as well as obviously just been in school, where larger companies due to their size and due to the fact that they just need to get the job done and they can't have, you know, a day of downtime if they can avoid it. Basically, they'll stick with stuff that works and they'll stick with stuff because they don't want to, you know, you can't have one project be view. And then have 10,000 projects still be WordPress. You know, they'll want, they'll, they want like all of their guys to learn Vue, for example. Yep. So this, so it's, it, I don't know where you would find the stats for this type of thing. I don't know what, you know, maybe, you know, offer some comment on that, Mike, but yeah. it's super interesting. So go, go ahead, go ahead for sure. Yeah. So, so another, th- another point I want to bring up is the, the Node.js versus PHP. And um, so there was a Reddit post recently that asks like, why aren't people using LAMP stacks? I'm, par- I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but LAMP stacks are just essentially just an Apache server stack. So you're using PHP on top of Apache server, HTML, JS in the, in the front end. Uh, that's just the standard stack that everyone, if you're an old school dev, you learn those languages and you just use them, PHP for the server. And someone was asking, why isn't anyone using that anymore? And the, the answer is, is that everyone is using that still. I mean, the majority, we, we can... The majority of the web is run on PHP still, and there's a, there's massive reasoning for that because there's still many many companies like you're saying, Matt, these these massive corporations that are using PHP because they've been using it this entire time. Why would they invest their time and money into hiring developers that know Node when their PHP is it's still working? There's nothing wrong with PHP. Like people say, oh yeah, no Node is way better. It's it has its advantages. I want to be clear that Node does have its advantages in kind of like a real-time chatting application, or if you have like a concur something, a, a bunch of concurrent users, they can queue up in Node much better. Um, Node definitely has its advantages, but it's not like a one fit. You know, you can use it for everything, and it's way better than PHP for everything. No, that's totally not true. PHP can do many things that are better, uh, and it, mostly they're the same. Like mostly they perform the same task just differently. So. The reason that Node is gaining popularity is because people that are learning um, right now, and this is this is again, like Matt said, this is my theory almost, and something that I've read online many times. I have no, I have no backing evidence, obviously, to this. But what I see is that people are learning JavaScript as they go to be a front end dev, and then when they get hired by a company, they're like, "Oh, what do you know, JavaScript?" Use Node because Node runs on JavaScript. Why would we hire another developer when we can just get one of our front end guys that already knows extensively the front end and can build a back end for the front end that he knows in the same language? So yes, it's great like for, for a smaller company that's just starting out, or for a developer that's just starting out, and they see Node JS. Wow, they can only they they only have to learn JavaScript and then HTML and CSS, and they can build a whole stack top to bottom to be able to to program. That's great, but that's not to say that PHP is any less popular. Like these massive corporations that have hundreds and hundreds of developers, they're using PHP. Most of them are. Most of them are still using PHP because that's what they they, they can't they can't physically switch all of their services. Maybe some of the microservices are on Node, but like the the big chunk of the web, I'd say if thirty one percent of WordPress if 31% of the web is powered by WordPress, imagine, because WordPress is PHP, again, I want to reiterate that, imagine the amount of people that are using PHP. And, like, not even necessarily just just WordPress, like, just mm-hmm. literally using PHP in their own in their own projects of their own CMS Absolutely. that they made or something. Yeah, For sure. Like yeah, and PHP, PHP is pretty cool. Like, I, I'm sure most, a lot of people have heard of Laravel. That's a great framework on top of PHP, constantly updated, really give like if you're if you're familiar with node and those kind of frameworks i think it gives a really good um it has that familiar feeling to it uh with routes and stuff like that i haven't gone too far into it i've just kind of got the top layer because one of the contracts that i'm working on actually uses uh is using laravel and i've got to take over that project so i've, I've got to get up to speed with it as well that's a future project that i'll have um but yeah 
PHP is absolutely a, a powerful and good language. And there's people are the people are asking why isn't anyone talking about or using P, uh, Lamp stacks? Absolutely, they are. You're just not hearing about it as much because, like Matt's saying, we're our guess is that these freelancers that are just starting out and want to communicate with the industry and uh, don't have their notoriety up as much yet and want, want to get that notoriety they're they're the ones that are publishing these articles about the newer frameworks like node and Vue and uh well pretty much like what, what what we're doing right like we're we're i'm learning Vue. it's a newer it's i mean it's not the newest framework i believe it was 2013 or 2014 so it's been around for a little while but still in in comparison terms it's pretty new it started to gain popularity now uh, yeah, so I'm totally like I'm, I'm I like I saw what I liked and I jumped it on the bandwagon because I can. I'm a I'm a freelancer. I'm a we we kind of have a small company. We can do what we want. Like it's it's our decision. But if we had a bigger company or if I was integrating with a massive project, which I currently am, absolutely I use PHP for that. And and also to build off of that too. And and again, this is just a theory, but I was you and I you and I had discussed like why is it that the that the freelancers are like trendy and loud if you will not that's not an insult but just like trendy and loud like they want to do the biggest trend they're they're the ones generating the trend and they're loud they're writing the articles they're asking the questions on reddit and forums and wherever else but if you were in a day job where you literally just made templates in wordpress or you were maintaining a website in something as old as joomla or if you i mean i shouldn't say something as old as joomla i think it's still up i think it's still updated but like i like look at that like i haven't heard of freaking joomla I haven't like like seen a project in Joomla in years, but I'm mm-hmm. sure there's tons of them out there. Oh yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like and, and like that that's an attestment to it right there is if you were doing a day job where like I like I like Mike and I discussed if we had, you know, somehow gotten a a lifetime gig somewhere, you know, like we signed a contract with a person where they were like, "Okay, we make a million dollars per WordPress template. The, you know, total hypothetical situation. We make a million dollars per WordPress template. We'll give you a hundred grand each time you make a WordPress template, and we need WordPress templates for the next, you know, thirty years. We would literally just be like, okay, and just immediately dig into dig into WordPress because that's that's a smart business decision. You would dig into WordPress. You would keep making those templates, and you would just like I wouldn't go on on. I wouldn't try to expand myself. I would try to expand myself within WordPress. But I'd be doing it every single day. I don't. I have no need really to go to Reddit. I have no need really to write a blog post. I'm set. And a lot of these guys who are in larger firms, they're probably set too. It's like, hey, I'm part of the I'm part of the Joomla team. I'm part of the PHP guy, the mm-hmm. team. I'm part of the Node team. I'm part of you know the maybe the Pure team, or I'm part of the like the Pure JS and that. Like 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 I'm part of those. I'm part of whatever team, and I am. That's it. Like that's my job. And and. You know, whereas some people say it's really bad to stay stagnant and or get to get stagnant and not expand your skills. I, I total theory, but I believe that people are doing just, just that they are. They're finding something like, you know, and yep. power to them. They're finding something cushy, finding something that, you know, gives them the money they need to live like the hours, whatever. And they just stick with it. And there's no reason to go, you know, ham in the industry. There's a reason why you see a lot of guys when they hit success, they just like, like rich people kind of disappear. You know what I mean? Like, like the, like if you look at somebody like Elon Musk, even like to take it out of web, if you look at somebody like Elon Musk, he tweets and he talks a lot and that type of thing. But a lot of guys, like, you know, if we were, if we were hitting, you know, HTML, all the things hard and suddenly it would just start making like a billion dollars. You'll never see me again. Like, like honestly, (laughs) (laughs) but you know what I mean though? Like, it's such a ridiculous scenario, but like, like realistically speaking, like if I make, if I just suddenly make two billion dollars, am I really going to be like, man, I really got to keep up to date on that JS thing? I'm gonna well, be like, no, but, I'm gonna it, live off the interest. Goodbye. You know sure, what I mean? but 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 you're 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 assuming that these uh, that these like lowly developers that are like doing WordPress constantly are making a billion dollars. Like I I think they're making a very good living wage. A lot a lot of these people are probably making a very good wage. And they're probably uh, happy with that. And you know what? A lot of people don't need necessarily to be on the top on the top of the edge. And they're not necessarily doing this because they love programming. Some some people are doing this because they needed a job at the time. They found a skill that they could do, and they're doing it. Like they they have a family. They go home after they go home after work. Like imagine this, people. You go home after work and you just disconnect. You're not on social media. I can't even imagine that right now. Can we, like. 
right right before this uh, this podcast, we posted a post on Instagram, and I'm like, oh, what, 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 did it get any likes? I'm I'm yeah, turning yeah, into yeah. one of those you were people. Going crazy, man. Yeah, you're I'm turning into crazy. one of those people. But like, even right now, uh, <laughs> a- after this, I'll probably check what what what's our social media doing and stuff like that. I can't disconnect. I'm con- I I need to check like what's what's up with our web dev. What's up with uh, the new the newest uh, frameworks? Like anything? Does anything get updated? Like I'm constant. I constantly need to be on top of everything. But not everyone is like that. Like a lot of people just do this for a job. Like I can't. Uh, I I think a lot of I think people don't understand that when they're when they're in this group like when they're in when they're in the like tech group and they they love the the technology that they're doing like they just don't understand that some people aren't like minded and they're doing this to kind of get a paycheck and they don't want to write about the tenth millionth uh, template that they've made in WordPress that had no innovation whatsoever uh, and and nothing like again nothing wrong with that but like uh, that that's that's why we probably don't see them writing about it because like if you make if you go into wordpress and there's i'm sure there's leaps and bounds still to be made in wordpress uh but like i'm also sure that there's a million other articles that have came out since like 2008 and 2007 you know back in the wordpress's heyday so everything is kind of trendy as it is and people follow trends and try to try to jump on trends and that's what that's what this is really like that's that's why we don't hear as much in my opinion about these older frameworks that are still very heavily used and will probably be very heavily used for a very long time and for moving forward i don't know if ujs is going to be the next big framework that everyone will use i i think it has the potential of being just because of how we kind of even like today's interaction really reinforces my opinion that ujs is something big because like you you picked it up very quickly and i like i don't think a framework because like, you're not really you don't really like frameworks in general you like the j the, the basic code of, i don't think a framework has really caught on with you as fast as vue.js did especially with the extensible like how extensible vue.js is i think i think the the same the same is true for cms like couch cms might be mm-hmm. you know rather basic in in several respects but it was the fact that i would write up a static site and then i'd be like okay i'm gonna add this dynamic title i'm going to add this dynamic yeah. blog section it wasn't like oh my god i gotta like you know get the figure out figure out exactly what the guy needs you know make the make a temp make a custom template for him you know add the template to the thing like you would have to with wordpress and that type mm-hmm. of thing and then you're like fighting with the interface you know what i mean i really like the the, the pure stuff i guess close to the metal mm-hmm. if you will as we've said before for sure yeah what two things actually i thought of as we were as we were sitting here was one of the one of the big ones is it's 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 super interesting that maybe maybe the people who are in these jobs are contributing to the community but they're contributing to the community in just what they're doing so that like that had just occurred to me so if you're huge into wordpress maybe it's not that they're sitting stagnant and not learning anything new but they might only be talking in the wordpress forum because you see those Possibly. those people with like oh fifteen thousand posts and they're online all the time and you like you know what I mean like you'll you'll see their answer from like eight years ago maybe you're looking something up and then you notice that they're online for Christ's sake you know mm-hmm. what I mean so it's like they've you know they've virtually never never left they've mm-hmm. never left the 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 form so it's possible that they're they're just sitting there you know doing doing their job but they're they are not sitting stagnant they're just really really focusing on on what they're doing so that's that's super interesting also that comment about unplugging too like that's that's a really key that's a really key thing too is a lot of people will just like they need they need to unplug whereas like i don't know whether it's because we're newer or what but like it's it's virtually impossible like just to get through a tv show i had to put my phone on a table across the room yeah like it's it's bad it's bad actually it's, bad. it's, it's really like, bad yeah, i feel it's bad but I, I don't see any other way around like if we want uh, and this is being candid with everyone, but we, if we want this to succeed, we can't just like silence our phones and be like, oh, well, let's not do social media today. Or let's but, not answer but, customer yeah, we, email or something even. Exactly. Yeah. Like we can't, we can't realistically expect people to listen to us and understand us if we're just not putting out content. Um, I want, I want people to, to learn the way I'm learning. And the, the thing is, is that I, I know that not everyone will be able to do that. 
but I'm hoping that there's some people are that are like minded that will appreciate and value the content that we make. Right. That's what my that I have to hope that otherwise, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> but like and what what the social media does is it propagates the content. And so we need to follow up on it. Like we need to make sure we're doing the best job we can to not spam people, but to give people the content that they that they're looking for. So. Like it's a tough, it's a tough balance to play because we don't want to be those like all constantly on our phones people, but it's also like, what, what do we do? It, yeah. It's just, it's almost, it's almost like a, like a hazard of the job to an extent too. Yeah. Like it's, it's like, it's not like I, it's not like I dislike being on, you know, Instagram or Facebook or, or Twitter. It's just, it's just the fact that it's become a muscle memory to pick up the phone, I think. Mm-hmm. And like when you were looking, for example, you were looking at, and it's only been a few short weeks. But when you were looking at that Instagram post, you're like, how, how, like you were, I think we were setting up a laptop or something and you were like, what, uh, what's the like count at? And I was like, I don't know. I only checked that a couple of times a day. Cause I, cause I was doing exactly what you were, what you are doing mm-hmm. where I, and I just like, but I was doing it across Facebook and Twitter and like, <laughs> we had like purchased a boost on, on uh, Facebook and like, I was like going ham and I just got to the point where I was like, I'm literally like, I'm literally on this site for so long that I'm, I'm watching just for one other like or one other follow or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, this is okay. I got to stop because it's not helping. Mm. I'm going to like focus on the content and like, I'll definitely be active on here. But like seeing that one person show up as a follower or that one person that, you know, double tap to like, isn't going to help me, you know, immediately I can wait an hour or two and Mm -hmm. check it then. So that's, I mean, it's a you know, it's almost almost a little off topic at this point, but Definitely, that's sort of, yeah. that, that's sort of a way for us to that's sort of a way for me anyway to get away from it. Yeah, it's it's understandable. So yeah, like to bring it back a little bit on topic, uh, I think we're part of the thing, right? Like, so we're part of the loud and trendy, and to be to be loud and trendy, and we have to follow the trends and we have to stay on top. But the silence, like you're saying, uh, these people that work at a job every day and do the same exact framework every day. They're not necessarily not as loud and not as trendy, but they're, they have their own way of finding answers and they have their own way of kind of sharing their own work. And I think it's not the same as what we do. So we, I don't think that they use Reddit and I don't think that they use uh, Instagram and Twitter and those kinds of outlets. I think that they're using more of a, traditional means like you said forums or maybe stack overflow and stuff like that to get their answers and i it that that it's got to be something like that right like it even an internal forum an internal forum like exactly on a company company? yeah those are big like in in one of our companies we have one of those internal forums and a lot of answers were solved inside of that form like i never really had to go to stack overflow or go go outside of my own company so potentially yeah that for sure and and again like if you're a a wordpress user and you pay for their premium package i'm sure you could even contact wordpress right and they could solve your issues so uh, those are those are kind of my guesses as to what's happening with the silence and this massive you know again let's get back to this 31 percent of the internet wordpress powers 31 percent of the internet like that's so much like that's so much it's almost (laughs) yeah like just wordpress it's yeah. one of, one of the things I just thought of too is, and this is this is pretty interesting is, and it, it, it's on topic and off topic. So I remember I remember I was working one time, and this one guy said, because I was like talking about my gaming PC and when it was brand new, and I was talking about using the new drivers and this type and the other thing. And the one guy behind me, he was he was like a young guy, like he was only like maybe like maybe five years older than me, mm-hmm. and he said he said, "You're still at the point in which you care," and he said. It's not that I don't care, but he's like, I literally have a job to do and I just want it to work. And so he <laughs> said that, like, if I need to go somewhere, he's like, even if it's leisurely, like, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but like, if, if I want to go somewhere, I just need a car to get me there. If I need to do work, I, like, you know, I literally need a laptop. He's like, I don't care if it has, you know, the display from Samsung that has the best saturation or anything. He's mm-hmm. like, I just need to get it done. And he, he was using like a super old phone and like half the buttons are broken. He's like, but I don't use those buttons. <laughs> and like, that would drive me crazy. Like even to this day, yeah. but I can see his philosophy in that. Like we were talking even before 
where I'm trying to like consolidate a couple of my computers into one because I just want it to work for me and it's easier. And I wonder if it's one of those things where it may, it's not necessarily sitting stagnant as we had discussed. It might even be one of those things where you're starting to refine your craft so much that you're you're getting to the point where you understand exactly what you need and why you need it and it you know you do sort of plateau to an extent like we don't need like six computers i don't need eight tablets you know what i mean i just yeah i always i always like joke and say oh i'm just getting old but maybe it's just maybe it is just like those people that hit the day job they've just refined their craft down to no. oh and you know let's check out what the latest update does to templates or themes you know yeah. on wordpress and that type of thing. So that's, I don't know, it's super interesting. And it'd be something that I definitely encourage somebody to comment on or even email us or something to, to you know, describe your experience and, you know, what, why, why do you or why don't you involve yourself with the community and all the new trendy stuff? So that, that'd be a super interesting, uh, super interesting, like, topic of discussion with, with the yeah, public, for sure. For we'd sure. love to hear some feedback on that from people. Um, unless you have any more comment, I think, I think we're good to go. Yeah, I, I think, think the, yeah. I mean, just, just for for just having started Vue.js today, we've, well, I mean, like you've started a while ago, but me, I've had quite a bit to, dis- to say already. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I think I think it's an uh, interesting perspective. I think we'll do another Vue.js episode maybe down the line where we talk about some more advanced topics and it'll kind of match with where my guides are going. Um, but for now, I think, yeah, this, I think this gave a good insight for uh, especially newer developers and developers that are in our shoes with the static from going from static to reactive, a good, in, a good way to kind of approach it. Yeah. When to jump, when to jump ship, when to yeah. switch, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I'm sure the next time we've talked about Vue.js or I assume we'll probably have HTML, all the things.com up yeah. hopefully so that we'll at least, uh, we'll at least have more actual project experience. But if yep. you uh, if you like what you listen to, thanks for listening thus far, and of course follow us or subscribe to us on the various app or the various app or website or whatever you're doing, whatever you're listening to us on, because we're absolutely everywhere basically. Uh, so make sure you like us on there and get leave us a review on that on those Apple Podcasts or leave us a comment or a like on uh, Castbox or whatever other app you're using. And thanks a lot for listening. Find us all on all the social media channels as per the usual. 